And I would like to introduce Mark Yagi. Mark is the executive director of the Waterkeeper Alliance, the largest and fastest growing nonprofit solely focused on clean water. Mark has dedicated his entire career to environmental advocacy and has been instrumental in expanding the Waterkeeper movement around the world for nearly 20 years. Mark leads with a deep personal passion for clean water and provides organizational leadership by developing strategic partnerships and promoting the Waterkeeper model of advocacy. Mark works daily to raise public awareness about the issues central to the organization's vision for clean, healthy, and abundant water for all people and the planet. Mark, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you, John. Can you hear me okay? Great. Uh, well, good morning, everyone, on this cold Saturday. Snowy one for me. I'm not sure about where you are, how, whether it's snowing where you are, but we've got quite a bit coming down. Um, I want to thank you all for having me here today. I'm grateful to John and the whole team at Save the River and Upper St. Lawrence Riverkeeper for inviting me and for all the great work they do to protect the mighty St. Lawrence. Um, there's a great lineup of experts and speakers coming today and next weekend with discussions about sturgeon and invasive species and more. Uh, I'm going to kick things off today with a global to local chat about our most, uh, our most important natural resource, which of course is water. Uh, think about it for a moment. You know, every part of our lives is affected by water. You know, we drink it or we die. We use it to grow crops. We fish in our rivers and we fish in our seas, bathe and wash with it. it water is a source of recreation, uh, relaxation and rejuvenation. In fact, our, our, you know, our relationship with water is so obviously intrinsic to our existence, but yet we often take it for granted. Uh, and most of us have powerful memories of water. Maybe it's a special beach vacation, uh, learning to swim or sail, fishing with our parents, um, canoeing on the St. Lawrence River, or on a day like today, maybe ice fishing, perhaps for perch or pike where you are, um, or that sweet bass. Um, think about your memories of water and what your connection is. You know, for me, my, uh, my love of water began when I was growing up in the Susquehanna River watershed in Pennsylvania, where I could uh, step outside my back door and walk for miles. And when I was a boy, I had a golden retriever named Ben and Ben swam and fished with me. Uh, well, he didn't, he didn't really fish, but <laughs> we swam and fished in creeks and rivers and ponds and lakes from you know, May to October. Um, it was after school, it was on weekends, uh, day after day after day in the summer, really being in on and around water was freedom and happiness. And I had always assumed that these types of experiences were shared by everyone. But when I got older and learned more and, and began to travel the world, I discovered that not everyone can go down to their local waterway and be able to jump in and have a swim without fear of getting sick and that not everyone can turn on a tap and draw a cool glass of drinking water that is sure to be free of toxic chemicals and not everyone can uh, catch a fish and bring it home and cook it without fear of poisoning their family and I couldn't understand how such an important resource wasn't available to everyone or how other kids couldn't experience something that was so second nature to me. And it's not even just a matter of fairness. It's not a, a the situation is beyond unfair. It's actually killing people. You know, today, more than 2 billion people worldwide don't have access to drinkable water. Uh, water scarcity affects nearly half the world's population. And yet at the same time, we're polluting what little available clean water we have left. Because every day, 2 million tons of sewage, industrial, and agricultural waste are discharged into the world's waters. You know, during uh, well, non-COVID times, in fact, half, more than half of the world's hospital beds are filled with, with, with someone suffering from a waterborne illness. And 
you know, every year more people die from unsafe water than from all forms of violence, including war. And then I'd say, consider this, uh, 3.2 million children under the age of five die annually as a result of unsafe drinking water and poor sanitation. It's 3.2 million children. It leads you to ask sort of how can we be so how can we be so cavalier about the ways that water is wasted, the way it's uh, violated, the way it's polluted, the way it's misused and ill-distributed? We would think that the case for clean water would be so obvious that it needs no defense, it needs no advocates. And so that questioning led me to, well, it led me to ask like, what can I do about it? And ultimately that led me to Waterkeeper Alliance where we're proud to have Upper St. Lawrence Riverkeeper as a member. And like all organisms that grow and flourish, the waterkeeper movement started out as a single seed. It was in, back in 1966, in fact, where on, um, on the Hudson River downstate, uh, a group of recreational and commercial fishermen banded together to take a dying river back from polluters and restore it to its true owners, the people of the Hudson Valley. Uh, first, they were known as the Hudson River Fishermen's Association and later Hudson River Keeper, and they patrolled the river, they identified pollution problems, and they forced polluters to begin to clean up their mess, to, to undo the damage that they had wantonly inflicted. And thanks to these fishermen and the laws they helped put on the books, the Hudson River is now recognized as an international icon of ecosystem revitalization. And today, you know, out of that seed that grew in the 1960s, Waterkeeper Alliance is a global organization uniting more than 330 waterkeeper groups in 48 countries on six continents. And combined, those groups, including Upper St. Lawrence Riverkeeper and, and all around in 48 countries, uh, combined, they're employing, uh, employing more than uh, 1,200 advocates protecting waterways. In fact, we have more advocates on the water than any other organization in the world. There's water keepers now uh, in China and in India and in Ireland and Bangladesh and Sweden and Kenya and Australia, uh, Colombia, Mexico, Peru and beyond. And, beyond. and that, that includes your upper St. Lawrence River keeper who's out protecting and preserving and restoring the upper St. Lawrence River. I think as they say now and for generations to come. And, Waterkeeper Alliance is locally based clean water organizations. Now, um, these groups like Upper St. Lawrence Riverkeeper in these 48 countries are patrolling and protecting uh, about 3 million square miles of watersheds around the world. And it's for approximately three quarters of a billion, a billion people and, and counting. When, uh, when people ask what a waterkeeper does, I say they stand on the shoulders of those Hudson River fishermen in the 1960s. They identify a problem and they use citizen, science, citizen action and science and law to solve it. And really drawn from different languages and different cultures, and different religions and different legal and political frameworks. These are dedicated women and men who are out fighting for a world where everyone can drink from their local water source without fear of ingesting toxins, where people can catch and cook a fish without fear of being poisoned, and where children are nurtured by water, not sickened by it. And now on top of this, of course, we confront what Pope, what, what, uh, Pope Francis has called the existential crisis of climate change which is altering the chemistry of our oceans, the character of our coastlines, and the timing and intensity of rain and snow uh, wreaking havoc across the planet. We, we see that interface of water and climate, um, really climate change is a water issue. And we see that interface through the work of our water keepers, whether it's in Ladakh, India, our Himalayan glacier water keepers will tell you that over the past decade, things have turned upside down. It snows when it shouldn't. Uh, it doesn't rain when it should. Some of the communities there have had to be relocated due to drought, while others have been forced to rebuild after devastating floods. Or in Mongol Mongolia, our Tool River water keeper reports that drought is forcing more and more people to migrate from the countryside into cities that aren't equipped to handle the population growth. Or back here in the US, our, our Puget Sound Keeper in Seattle 
sees ocean acidification threatening a $270 million a year shellfish industry. Or in Louisiana, uh, they've seen the government remove the names of, of more than 40 names of places on maps that were because those places no longer exist, except in the memories of the coastal residents who saw that land disappear. And I think you, you see it where you are with dramatic changes in water levels or perhaps changes in waterfowl migration patterns. And there are a lot more examples like that, but we can see there's, you know, there's a common theme of climate and water being so inter interconnected. And certainly have a lot of those stories of uh, doom and gloom about climate and water. But of course, there's also hope. Uh, to me, I would say, make no mistake about it, that humanity has the, the ingenuity and the ability to solve these crises. And for us at Waterkeeper Alliance, we believe that highly trained, effective local leaders like our waterkeepers, like your upper St. Lawrence Riverkeeper, are critical to this work. Um, you know, from the beginnings of this work more than 50 years ago, the fundamental uh, underlying principle of our, our philosophy has been that change starts at the local level. I'm gathering that most of you are in New York. So you know that New York State's plastic ban, bag ban didn't start as a top-down imposition from the state. Rather, citizens, after becoming aware of the plight of plastic pollution, they took action in their local communities and they secured local bans on plastic bags. And then other communities replicated that success until the issue of a plastic bag ban reached a tipping point and drove the state to adopt a statewide ban. And you know, similarly around the world, decisions about vital issues like energy sources and transportation options and land use and zoning are most often made locally. And as a result, it can often be easier to get things done locally. Because local action can be tailored to the people and the culture of the community. It involves a shared decision rather than a top-down imposition. And it makes it easier to hold local decision makers accountable. And so we've always believed that highly trained, effective local leaders are critical to tackling the issue of how best to ensure that people everywhere possess their basic right to clean water. And I'm inspired by the water keepers around the world who are fighting daily, uh, putting their risk, at, uh, putting and put at risk with their safety, they, and, and standing up for their beloved bay and river or lake or stretch of coastline. I'm gonna give an example in, in 2006, a small group of villagers in Han Bay, Senegal formed um, Han Baykeeper to restore the health of their waterway. And I was there as they were getting started in 2006. And it was the most polluted place I'd ever seen. Um, they have no, san there's a, it's a village of about 40,000 people. There's no sanitation service. When you stand on the beach, looking out at the bay, there's uh, raw sewage coming from the capital city of Dakar, which has actually had capacity to treat that sewage, but instead dumps it into this poor village's bay. Uh, underneath the village chief's home is a pipe discharging petrochemicals from a Libyan owned oil facility. Pet, uh, facility. On the, and then further down to the left is a pipe discharging a brown noxious substance from a, a meat rendering plant. And of course, all along the beach is uh, massive amounts of algae and food waste because when they've done cooking and cleaning, Everything's brought down in a bucket and dumped onto the beach. Uh, and why, so widespread industrial pollution and, and untreated sewage had long sickened the villagers and it impoverished the fishermen. Like the fishermen could no longer fish in the bay. It had been this artisanal fishing village 25 years before because it was so polluted. Now the fishermen had to take their wooden pirogues out into the open ocean. It cost them money and gas. It took them away from their families. And it was dangerous because they were, some of them would be hit at night by ocean tankers. And this group of, of uh, villages, the villages broken into soccer clubs, football clubs. And one of the clubs was a, um, one of the clubs was in, involved in education and outreach to the community about things like uh, hygiene and HIV AIDS. And they wanted to restore the health and grandeur of their bay. 
um, but they weren't having success in doing it. One of the um, one of the villagers had grown up and moved away to not not far from you all in Toronto, and learned about water keepers in on the on the on Lake Ontario and on Petticodiac River, and brought that idea back to the, the villagers to the soccer club and. Uh, that's when they that's how they wanted to start a water keeper group and when I was so I was there in 2006 seeing the most polluted place I'd ever seen and their leader is named Mbeke and Mbeke uh, I told Mbeke I said you know I'm not sure how we can help you because there are no water keepers in Africa right now at the time there were none now there are about 15 uh, we don't have anybody on staff who speaks Wolof or French and I'm just not sure how we're going to be able to help you. And, and Becky said back to me, he said, well, look, you have a, you, you, the water keepers have created an international reputation. You'll give us credibility. Uh, I'm going to learn English and I'm going to come to all of your conferences like this one. And I'm going to learn from all of the veteran water keepers that have addressed issues like I'm addressing and learn about the strategies. And I'm going to come back and use them here. And so he convinced us into, into starting Han Baykeeper. And um, sure enough, Mbeke learned English and he came to all of our conferences and you would always see him learning from other water keepers and learning about strategies and ways to implement pollution strat uh, advocacy in his community. And by, uh, by 2014, after spending years of meeting with water keepers and our staff and learning successful strategies, I was in, actually I was in, Nepal at the time, and I remember opening up my laptop at the end of the day, and there was an article about how Han Baykeeper had been successful in convincing the Senegal government, the French Development Agency, and the European Investment Bank to commit $68 million to fund the cleanup of Han Bay. And Han Bay now is no longer recognizable to me. It looks completely different. Um, and even a few years after that, Han Baykeeper also succeeded in organizing community members to stop the construction of two coal-fired power plants, which was a first for Africa. And so those are the type of work that just is so inspiring here. And, and to see these global challenges being taken, these water challenges being taken on by local leaders. You know, a few other examples would be our Columbia Riverkeeper in Oregon has combined grassroots organizing with savvy legal strategies to defeat every single proposed fossil fuel export terminal in the Pacific Northwest. Or Miami Waterkeeper, who's taken the lead on fighting to save the areas that are irreplaceable coral reefs and has followed that up by taking legal action to ensure proper sea level rise planning for their community. Our, our Huang River Waterkeeper in, in Vietnam, who's using ecosystem-based adaptation to enhance flood resilience in urban and coastal areas. And so you multiply those projects by 334 groups and you begin to get an idea of the kind of work that, and, and the work and the success that uh, John and all of the water keepers around the world in this water keeper movement are having by combining local leadership with citizen action, with science, and with law. Uh, at the end of the day, really it's, Apathy and non-involvement are the ultimate enemies of positive change and meaningful progress. And you know, if you care about the future, being a bystander is not an option. And we really have our own reasons individually of why we want to be part of the solution. And I always want to encourage everyone to think about your reason. Why is why why is is clean water important to you? Um, you know, think about what it means to you. You know, I haven't been up to your community in many years. Uh, would love to get back, but I still recall the incredible beauty of the communities and the water resources. It's a place that nurtures your soul and brings you happiness and a measure of peace. And a place that I hope you will refuse to stand by, and I know you'll refuse to stand by and watch be sacrificed to the profits of fossil fuel barons or needlessly destroyed by plastic pollution. Uh, when you think about why it's important to you, I can guarantee you it helps you become more engaged. You, you know, to make sure you're you're engaged with Upper St. Lawrence Riverkeeper and Save the River on some of their work, like John was talking about, the water monitoring programs, the beach watch program, the trash-free rivers cleanups, and and make your voice heard when facing proposed projects that will adversely impact your water resources because they belong to you. And I guess the, you know. 
that's a big part of why I still work on these issues. For me, it's up close and personal. I've got a, a 10 year old daughter and a 13 year old son who mean everything to me. And I don't want to ask myself 20 years from now why I didn't do more to ensure that they have a safe and healthy future. You know, I want their lives to be full of clean water and clean air, clean energy, equality, good jobs, a strong economy. I don't want them to look back with, with uh, bewilderment and contempt at their parents' generation and ask, like, how did, how did you bequeath us contaminated rivers and dying oceans and dirty air and denuded forests or sterile fields? We owe it to these future generations to give them a better world than what we inherited. And not a world where we don't have enough water to drink or a world where there's more plastic in the ocean than fish. As uh, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And I remember uh, former President Obama once referenced that quote in a commencement address at Rutgers University. Uh, he agreed with the quote, but he also felt that the arc of the world doesn't bend towards justice, freedom, and equality on its own. Rather, it depends on us and the choices we make at certain inflection points in history. And so we all need to be the change agents who help bend the arc towards justice and create a world where clean water is a given and, rea and a reality for all. And a world where we treat all human beings and our environment with dignity and respect. Uh, and I'm grateful to be here with all of you and to learn from you. And it's been such an honor to be here today. And uh, I don't know if there, if, if uh, John, if there, if there's any questions or anything, but I'm really grateful to be here and want to thank you all for having me and thank you for all the amazing work that you do. Thanks, Mark. Um, I just want to hop on and say, if anybody has questions on the bottom of your screen, there is a Q and A box. So feel free to insert the, them there. I'm going to hand it back over to John. Okay, and Lauren, I think you have a couple of questions for Scott, if you want to go ahead. Um, for Mark? Um, for Mark, I'm sorry. The first question that came in is, what's the best recovery story from the Great Lakes or the location that holds the most promise? Well, that's a loaded question, because if I don't say the St. Lawrence, then, then I mean, John's going to shut me off the Zoom. <laughs> um, I think that the greatest story of recovery, I mean, I, I haven't spent, I, I think the one that I've experienced because I've spent time there and I haven't spent time with you all up in Clayton and around Clayton was, um, was seeing the change to probably the Buffalo and Niagara rivers up close with our Buffalo and Niagara water keeper. Um, you know, everyone knows uh, well, not, not everyone, but I think it's fairly widely known as the reputation of, you know, Love Canal and, and just being sort of the, um, the, the genesis of the Superfund law and hazardous, hazardous contamination. And to go up there and see the way that they have revitalized their downtown waterfront and the work that's been done to, um, with shoreline uh, restoration and beautifying the, the waterfront and getting people out there has been really amazing to see because I went there, I was there maybe 20 years ago and then back about 10 years ago and then another five years ago. And just, I, it's really noticeable and really interesting to watch. Um, I won't pretend to know the threats to the Great Lakes region anywhere closely as well as you all do, but uh, it seems like the, I mean, the question was about threats too, right? Mm -hmm. I think that, um, I mean, I, re I read and learn from our water keepers in the Great Lakes a lot about the invasive species, which I'm really interested in hearing about later today uh, as one of the issues. And then I just, um, I guess, worry about the referencing back to the point about waterways being misused and ill-distributed and, and the impact that the interface of climate change with water and, and the massive sort of uh, misallocation of water in the, in the West, in the arid West and the drought affecting that and the concerns that there's, you know, this, this people out there that are gonna wanna stick a straw into the Great Lakes and send it elsewhere when uh, really what they need to be doing is enhancing their conservation techniques and really doing things like water reuse. I think that's one of gonna be one of the things that's gotta be, we've got to force to be a trend 
is water reuse. You know, in Southern California, in California, uh, 19% of the energy that's used uh, in the state on water is just from moving water around. And so Southern California is getting its water from the north. It's being piped down with lots of motors and pumps running and then draining it also from the Colorado River. And people in Southern California, you know, brush their teeth or get a glass of water and, and, and use their water and it goes out into the ocean. It's like a one-time use when what they really need to be doing. And our, I know our LA water keeper and other water keepers in Southern California are pushing for this is to recycle it and reuse it over and over again, instead of just sending out into the ocean. And when you do that, it's got great climate change mitigation and it's got climate mitigation. It's going to create jobs and it's going to create water security and lessen the threat of other places that do have abundant water from being, uh, you know, a straw being shoved into them. Thank you. I'd like to add to that, Mark. I'm spending a lot of time in Buffalo these days on a, a different issue. And the transformation that's been brought on there by the Buffalo Niagara Waterkeeper is just amazing. I mean, as a waterkeeper, it makes me very proud of what they've done. Yeah, 100%. It's really great. Uh, there's another question that came in. Um, it's a multi-part question. How big of a problem are livestock feed producers for the water quality of the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence River and what is being done about them? That's a good question. I know, um, I mean, I defer, to, I defer to John on that because I don't know about your local, um, about the local issue. I know that, you know, um, industrial agriculture is a huge water quality problem across the world. Uh, in particular, you know, part of our focus has been on uh, uh, hogs and, and poultry operations. And, you know, the, the biggest issue is that there's no waste treatment and uh and that's what's causing fish kills and and it's it's poisoning people's drinking water and the water that they recreate in the biggest problem being that the the way that the the industry was very smart in that they set up a situation where uh these big industrial or uh, ag companies like a smithfield or a tyson they um they contract with farmers to grow their their animals. And um, the way they've set it up is they pay these contract growers a small amount of money to you know, shove all these animals into a confined, confined situation to, and they have to follow specific guidelines on the hormones to, that they need, how much hormones they need to give them and how much med various different medication they need to give them and to grow them to a certain size as quickly as possible. And the smart thing of what they set up with that whole thing is that um, the the industry the the corporation owns every bit of that animal from let's say snout to tail, except for the waste. They've gotten they've made it so they don't own the waste. They own everything else about the animal, but the waste that comes out of it. So the poor contract grower, who's not getting paid very much, has to deal with the waste. And what they do is they put it out into big lagoons, like big Olympic sized swimming pools, which then when there's heavy rains or hurricanes, it overflows, goes into the waterway, it breaches, uh, it you know, bleaches out into the waterway. Um, they take and they apply some of the waste to the fields as fertilizer, but they don't follow the rules about not doing it a certain amount of time before a big storm is coming. And, um, and that's destroying a lot of the waterways around the country and around the world. Uh, but I would defer to John about specific on St. Lawrence. Yeah, I, I just would uh, say that was a wonderful answer, Mark. The, the problem that we're seeing is, uh, is a heavier concentration up along the Great Lakes. But nevertheless, it is a problem along the river. It's a problem in uh, central New York. And it's an issue that's going to have to be addressed because the... the uh, pollution that it's causing is significant in the waterways. Yeah, and I, I should have added the, the thing that, it, the, also the thing that was ingenious about making it so that they don't own the waste is that they've made it so that they're not an owner or operator of that contract farm. And right. so what we're trying, what we've been trying to do for years is to create what's called integrator liability that would establish that that Smithfield or Tyson or whoever it is, is, does have, is an owner and operator. 
Um, but it's incredibly difficult to do legally and incredibly expensive. And you're going up against one of the most well-armed um, PR and, and legal machines on the planet. And um, they, they, um, they very quickly paint you as anti-family farm and spend tons of money in the press to, uh, and, and in the halls of the state legislature to keep it from happening. Yeah. Um, there is, uh, did we already answer that one? There's one more question and it kind of goes back to the first question that you answered um, about the threat in the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence River. But do you know what the most significant source of pollution is in the Great Lakes? Probably well, depends on the water body, I would think, right? Because I know that's one of the um, things that's so interesting and challenging of being at Waterkeeper Alliance with 334 groups around the world is they've all got so many interesting issues that they're working on. Um, there's a lot of overlap and, and a lot of them, um, you know, we're dealing with um, ag runoff, which I think I know is an issue in the Great Lakes and just look at Lake Erie, for example. Um, you know, storm, wa storm water is pretty common among everyone. Plastic pollution is pretty common among everyone. Um, and I think probably the greatest threat, I would actually say, well, I'll rephrase that. So we'll skip being about a specific pollution issue. I'd say the greatest threat is a subversion of democracy. And that the biggest threat is when the polluters are in the, po you know, the, the, the elected officials are in the pockets of polluters and that the campaign contributions get you know elected officials to turn a blind eye to pollution problems that are threatening us and it's really a time that we need to be getting to where the elected officials are representing the people not the polluters and i think that's our biggest challenge and and it goes back to um you know the it goes back to the the public citizen supreme court decision which allowed corporations to to contribute to um campaign, you know, campaign contributions. And it's almost like, I think that's one of the things we're lucky with the Clean Water Act is in 1972, it's almost like Congress had a crystal ball and could predict um, the increasing sort of uh, campaign contributions swaying the way that um, officials would look at pollution problems. And they created the citizenship provision, which allows any of us, anybody who's here today to take a polluter to court if government's not going to do its job. So, you know, if you're out on the uh, you're out canoeing on the St. Lawrence and you uh, and it's something you enjoy doing. And one day you see a pipe that's discharging a nox noxious liquid and and you um, and you go and find out who 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 where it's from. And you tell them that, you know, they need to fix it. And they say, yeah, thanks. Bye bye. Um, and then you go to the state D.C. or the EPA and you look at the and you look and you see they don't have a permit or maybe they're exceeding their permit and you say, you know, DEC, EPA, it's your job to fix this. And they say, yeah, that's nice. Um, why don't you go away? You can go and enforce the law because your interest and use and enjoyment of that waterway has been impacted by their pollution. And so um, I think sort of subversion of democracy is really the biggest pollution, the biggest threat we have regarding pollution in this country and in many other countries, in fact. I'd like to add in there, I, I didn't expect that answer. <laughs> uh, but no, it's a it's a wonderful answer because on the on the St. Lawrence River, I think everybody on here knows we're the receiver, I guess, of all the water from the Great Lakes, and it it all comes down through. So we we're affected by all the pollution problems. Uh, we've been fortunate in that we haven't seen the the big algae blooms yet. Uh, but we certainly have seen all the microplastics. Uh, we've seen the classic sewage pollutions. We've seen one of the most horrendous oil spills in history. Um, so, and, you know, the, another aspect of living in the Thousand Islands in the St. Lawrence River area is the beauty of it. And it's still fairly pristine. When we started our trash-free river cleanups, I think it was Buffalo Niagara 
just cautioned us that we ought to be telling our participants to be very careful about needles and syringes. And we all sort of looked at each other and said, I don't think we've ever seen a needle or syringe out in the waterway. So that's the difference that water keepers of only a couple hundred miles away face right, right. now in pollution. But anyway, I mean, I think your answer was a wonderful answer. I never, never would have thought of answering it that way, Mark. Well, I should clarify too. I, I don't want to try to um, indicate that it only started with the public, the the uh, Citizens United case. I, I call it public citizen, actually, Citizens United case. I mean that this has been happening obviously way before that. I think it's just sort of accelerated more with the coffers being opened up. But going back to that, um, when I was just giving us a little brief genesis of, of of the fishermen on the Hudson in the 1960s, one of their first big cases was. Um, against Penn Central Railroad, which was discharging millions of gallons of oil into the river and it was blackening the beaches and it was making the fish taste like diesel. And they couldn't sell, the fishermen were upset because they couldn't sell the fish at the Fulton fish market anymore. And so they went out and gathered evidence of um, Penn Central Railroads polluting, polluting the river and it being a violation of the Rivers and Harbors Act. And they went down to the Army Corps of Engineers in, in New York City, which in the Army Corps of Engineers was the regulatory authority for the Rivers and Harbors Act. And they went in and talked to them. And the response they got from the Army Corps of Engineers was, do you know who's on the board of directors of Penn Central Railroad? We can't do anything to them. <laughs> like that was it, you know, it's okay. Just spill billion, millions of gallons of oil into the river. We can't do anything to them because they're powerful and important. Wow. Well, Lauren, any other questions for Mark? That's all I have right now. Thank you, Mark. All right. Well, Mark, before I let you go, uh, I know that we had the opportunity to have your parents up here in Clayton last year, and they got the chance to go out fishing with uh, Jeff Garnsey. Uh, and everybody knows that there's no better advocate uh, for the river and the health of the river than Jeff. Uh, so I hope they had a great time. And I know if they were with him, they heard some great stories and saw some wonderful scenery. They loved it. We were just talking about it recently. They they loved it so much, and I think my father probably proved to Jeff that I that he's just uh, I, that he's as bad of a fisherman than I am. Is but I I still don't I don't give up. I still keep going out. <laughs> well, we hope you'll come up and bring your family up here because we'd love to show you more of the river. Would love uh, to. And thank you for all you do. I mean, I think. We all think Water Keepers is a very powerful organization and we're proud to be a part of it. Thank you, thank you. And I'm, I'm so great, grateful and honored to be here today and I'm gonna to stick around because I wanna to listen to about sturgeon and invasive species.